all cultures throughout history, food has intrigued and occupied us. But what defines a great food experience? And how can we take it even further? We aim to find out by exploring unconventional methods and innovations, as well as ancient techniques. This is Tasteology. We all have this tendency to sort of think we can tell just what the food tastes like. I can ignore the weight of the cutlery in my hand. I can ignore the colour of the plate. Uh, we'll put some different music on, but it's not affecting my taste perception. We all think we can do that, a restaurant critic, chef, um, psychologist or regular diner alike. And yet the result after result after result says, no, these things do matter. They do influence our experience. You cannot ignore them. What expectation do we get from just looking at a plate? And what impact do shapes, textures, and colors have on our perception of a meal? Our other four senses play a much larger role in how we experience tastes than most of us think. Chef Jacques Lamerde has had an anonymous Instagram account with over 100,000 followers. Every week, Jacques posts pictures showing plate creations that look like they came straight out of a tasting menu. But in reality, all the ingredients came from the nearest gas station. Speculations about Jacques' real identity have been raging among food critics, chefs, and followers, but not a single one of them has gotten it right. I developed Jacques in sort of like a perfect storm. I mean, I'd, I'd left my fine dining world behind, but yeah, I missed plating. I missed a lot of the stuff from restaurants that I used to do, because um, the restaurants I run now are very different. And I just, I said to them, I said, I, f I feel compelled to do this, and I do not know why, but I think it's funny. Generic banana gas station muffin concasse, Smucker's chocolate toppin', butterscotch snack pack crema, honey Teddy Graham's earth, and yellow Fruit Loops garnish. Hand-torn Wonder Bread, yellow mustard caviar, pickled baby onions, Hunt's Ketchup Coolie, Miracle Whip Expressions, Tiny Pickle Cross Sections, Doritos Dynamite Nacho Picoso, Cheese Whiz Rimmer. For me, I've always taken a, a great amount of joy in making fun of myself. So I really am making fun of chef culture. I'm making fun of the idea that, you know, the techniques are driving um, the food instead of the food driving the techniques. And um, there's a lot of things that you can kind of think about if you get a layer down in my plates and the captions. You know what, Doritos are actually, I find them to be very versatile. Um, they're very like rich in umami. Like if I was doing something more Tex-Mex inspired, I might go for a guacamole Dorito. Um, cool Ranch would have to be with something that was like a little bit lighter, you know? Um, because their flavor is, it's so soigné and yet so subtle. Soigné is the thing you hear over and over again in culinary school and this idea of like make it nice, make it soigné, and it just, it really did sort of epitomize the account, the idea of again taking these foods like gas station burritos and elevating them to a soigné plane was very, um, you know, very much like at the heart of what I wanted to do. For sure, I think Things will taste better if they're plated beautifully. And if you're going to Noma, um, I think a huge component of it is how things are plated. Because there's not a lot of food there. Am I right? <laughs> Jacques Lemaire's creations epitomize the saying trash to treasure. But what if you were served one of Jacques' plates? Would you experience single packaged cheese and gas station burrito? Or would your brain be tricked by this stunning presentation? Chef Joseph Youssef and Professor Charles Spence are a duo working on understanding and innovating the full taste experience. Their project, Kitchen Theory, explores how our other four senses affect our taste perception and overall eating experiences. When I met Professor Spence about five years ago at a talk he was doing, and he touched upon color taste associations and aromas and sounds and textures, and. And it fascinated me to a point that uh, I knew this was someone I had to work with. I 
Professor. How are you? Good, 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 thank you. Very good. I'm a gastrophysicist, uh, which means that I'm interested in systematically studying in the association, surprising associations between the senses. So what's great about working with chefs like Joseph is if you, know, you can talk to him and, and if you can convince him of some idea, uh, something you just found out about the way things are plated or should be plated, he'll go away and it'll be on the menu next week or next month and we'd have real diners paying real money for what is hopefully great tasting food that has the benefits of the, of, of the neuroscience in it. What do I need to be looking at on a rectangular plate? What angles, when I'm so, facing yeah. the guest, do they need to be uh, seeing? So for, We've been very interested in the orientation. If you've got a dish that has something with a, a, a dominant line in it, in fact, people really don't like it when the, when the food points towards them in some way. People prefer uh, an oblique line. Uh, and in particular, they prefer a line that kind of uh, ascends to the right. Our eyes give us all the information we need about a food and we kind of reach back into our memory bank of all the foods we've ever eaten and kind of think, right, what's that red thing on the plate? Well, it could be, you know, potentially strawberry because it's red, it looks like a mousse, it looks like it should be sweet and everything I've eaten that's red and that's a mousse and that's in that shape has always been sweet, so that's probably going to be a strawberry mousse or a berry mousse. Um, we could see something else on the plate that has a different colour, make a whole different set of judgments about it. Josh, did you grill the nopal? Uh, some dishes you can plate them and they appear to be a dessert. Other dishes, when you change that plating of that dish, it can look like more of a savory dish. In this case, because you can so clearly see meat, people obviously associate it with a savory dish. But some dishes are a little less obvious. People associate colors with tastes. Uh, so in a dish that uh, Joseph has been serving and that we have been testing in the lab and online, we find from analysing the responses of diners in the restaurant that the majority of people will associate uh, the colour red uh, with sweet taste, the colour green with sour, uh, the colour white with salty, and the colour brownie black with sort of bitter taste. Whenever we see the colour of food on a plate, we can't just judge the colour of the food, we always see it against the background. So we find generally that if we serve exactly the same food, from a uh, round white plate versus a black plate. People will say that the food tastes much sweeter from the round and white plate other than the black one. Uh, in our hands, we get a um, sort of 10% change in sweetness perception, uh, simply as a result of the shape and color of the plate. Others find 30 or 40% really dramatic differences. When the color does not predict the taste, that's normally a bad thing. It's like, my brain's not doing its job. I should be able to predict what the world is like. It's not, I got a surprising taste. If it's in my mouth and surprising, that could be poisonous. But if I'm in a modernist restaurant, if I know I'm at the hands of, a, of a, an expert artist or chef at the top of their game, then I can sort of let go and enjoy that experience of surprise and be titillated and laugh as a result. So this is some ham. <laughs> it's actually a ham steak. I was very intrigued by it at the grocery store. Um, and I like the idea always of making like tartars and things out of cuts of meat that aren't particularly good. Because <laughs> again, it's all this knife work and all these you know different aspects go into it. Um, you are just taking something, again, that's a commodity and you're putting all this effort into it and making it look good. But at the end of the day, it's like some ham I got from a gas station but I love texture, like I've always been a big texture girl. So when I'm building a Jacques plate, I, I am always thinking about that. I'm like, how would this translate into the real world? It's like math and you always need to have on the plate something creamy, you need to have something crunchy, you need to have something kind of spongy and you add up all the components together and that's how you get, in my mind, a complete dish. So this is a tartare, right? And so with a tartare, you want a meat, you want an egg, you want something pickly, you want something crunchy, you want something salty. And in this case, because it's a ham tartare, I wanted something a little bit cheesy. So all of the flavor components are there. Um, it's just perhaps not what you would expect. And that's kind of my vibe, I guess. But yeah, I think it's done. Ham tartare, guys. I'm gonna take a picture of this one if that's cool.
first you have the music that plays when they're walking in. Okay, so I finish those things and then you start to serve the food. I go back. It's called the uh, offering to the gods. <laughs> right. Okay. Anything else? Questions? Answers? Once we've gone beyond that idea of understanding that the visual aspect of food is important, I think we all understand that. I think what's a little harder to grasp is when you start to talk to people about things like perceiving sound and its relationship to food. Professor Spence has coined this as sonic seasoning. If I tell you, maybe there's a, do you get the vanilla? Do you get the asparagus in the wine? Suddenly I'm drawing your attention to something in the wine and it becomes more salient to you. Kind of sort of, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, and you can do the same thing more subtly with music, I think, that if I play, say, tinkling high-pitched piano, that will sort of draw your mind towards the sweeter notes. If I play a very low-pitched kind of grating sound instead, that will draw your attention to the bitterness you're experiencing. One of the other projects we're working on is uh, thinking about this idea that most of what we think of as taste really comes from our nose. So it's the smell of, of food. If you believe the numbers that 95% of what we think we taste, we actually smell, that would lead to a radical change in the way you deliver food to people. Dry ice is a great way of carrying aromas. We don't just use dry ice, we scent the dry ice so that the dry ice plays a role. Other than the visual aspect, it plays a role in the aesthetics and the sensory elements and heightening your perception of aroma. Well, it's because it's not just about a sum of parts with flavor, it's also about how those flavors interact and the textures and the mouthfeel and the way in which we interact with them and the way in which we consume them. And that's what brings us that satiety um, and that enjoyment in eating. And it's not just about flavor. Color and plating, aroma and sounds, all play a significant role in our tasting experience. But there seems to be another component that counts for more than all the senses, something that can make even the most humble of meals stay in our memories forever. I th when I look back at my best food memories, um, I think that What's striking about them is, you know how personal they were. Um, and it's just, when you go out to eat or when you go over to someone else's house to eat, or even if you're just like having kind of a humble dinner at home, like the food that you're eating and who you're with um, and where you are, it, it all is part of a much bigger thing. Um, there's that emotion and the idea of you're experiencing something that is a little bit magical. My best food memory ever. God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God, that is... That's very hard to say. No, I remember many, many meals. I remember when Pierre Gagnère, um got an honoris causa degree in, um, in Belgium. And he was so moved that he made a, a dinner that I can still. My favorite meal is um, the one I have the winter solstice every year. And we shoot a deer in the small farm in Sussex just before I went to university. It's probably the most memorable one that I had, and it was around the time when I'd just been accepted into university. And I remember having dinner with my mother here in London. I think I had a steak, and I know I had red wine. My family has a cottage on a lake north of the city, and we have a smoker, and we smoked those ribs, kind of a very simple recipe, not so many heavy spicings. And we had those ribs, and we made some French fries, and my father made some pickles. He makes his own pickles. And we had that meal this summer, and there was just something about it. It wouldn't, doesn't sound all that special. Ribs, pickles, and French fries, and I think we had a salad, but oh my god, was that a good meal. The thing I remember with more pleasure is escaping from my grandmother and running to the coffee trees and eating the, the cherry of the coffee before it's picked. For me, that's a flavor I can forget. Cooking is first love. Imagine that I make a dish for you. Technically, it's a success. From the art point of view, it's all right. So everything's fine. And I throw it to your face and eat. 
this dish will not be good. Now if I say, please, have a seat. Oh, very comfortable one. Please sit down, be quiet, I will take care of you. And now you know this food product, I did it for you because I know your taste. And here it is. What does it mean? It means I love you. And when you say to someone, I love you, it is always better. So this is why my, my main idea for cooking, even if I'm a physical chemist and studying the technique, the main idea is cooking is first love, then art, and then technique. It's not just the ingredients that decide how we ultimately perceive our food. Texture and colour are also critical components, with the visual aspect of eating making up as much as 28% of our combined taste experience. By cooking with steam, ingredients retain more of their natural colour and texture. For vegetables, they keep more of their chlorophyll, making them naturally green and crisp. For meats, you get a tender, smooth texture, and since steam prevents water loss, a juicier result. However, it's not all about perception. Steamed meat or vegetables actually retain vitamins, nutrients, and flavors far better than food that's boiled or fried.